All right, if I could welcome all of you back. We're, we're going to move on to the information reports. And uh, right now, uh, we have an update on the governor's 2014-15 uh, budget proposal. Uh, Chancellor? Thank you, President Baca, members of the board. Uh, before I turn this over to the uh, Dan Troy to, for the specifics, let me just say in general that it, all of us know this is a far uh, better budget than we have seen in a number of years. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to uh, thank and acknowledge the good work of the governor and his staff and the Department of Finance, because what <coughs> you uh, will hear about in a moment is certainly an endorsement of the great work that's gone on at our colleges and a recognition, I think, on the part of the administration and finance that their agenda dovetails uh, nearly uh, line by line with ours. I'd also be remiss if I didn't uh, thank uh, all of the constituent groups, and I'm not going to single them out because I'd miss somebody and I don't want to do that, but all of the uh, folks represented in the audience and all the constituent groups who have really worked to present a unified voice with the administration and, uh, and finance. I think when you look at uh, the uh, uh, details that Dan will, will present in a moment, you'll see uh, that we, we did succeed as a result of that unified voice in getting, uh, I think, a tremendous consideration on the part of the administration. So with that, I will turn it over to Vice Chancellor Dan Troy, uh, who is our uh, sort of frontline troop, and will give you more detail. Dan? Yes, uh, thank you, Chancellor Harris, uh, President Baca, uh, members of the board, good afternoon. Uh, while it's always a pleasure to brief the board, uh, it's certainly the case that in prior years it is, I've not always been presenting pleasant news to you. Uh, today, uh, I'm happy to say I've got a very, very different, uh, very different qual character of news to provide for you as well. Um, uh, indeed, with a more uh, positive economic climate, particularly uh, driven by the strength of the stock market, and the uh, revenues generated by Proposition 30, uh, the governor's proposed budget for the 14-15 year uh, would take a major step toward expediting the recovery uh, of the community college system from the deep cuts we've taken uh, due to the economic downturn in recent years. Uh, we have many, many details to still uh, uncover and pour through over the next uh, few days or weeks, but today I present to you uh, what are, I think, the key top line uh, highlights. Uh, firstly, in terms of the state picture, uh, the general fund revenue picture is very strong. Uh, the governor estimates nearly $109 billion in general fund revenue, and uh, that is indeed higher than the level of general fund support that we saw in 2007-8 prior to the economic downturn, and that is the first time the state has actually uh, had more general fund revenue uh, than we did prior to that, uh, that economic downturn. Uh, the <coughs> governor does provide uh, 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 a, uh, a balance of nearly $2 billion in various accounts, so there is a uh, a reasonable reserve uh, 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 detailed by the governor as well. Uh, in his uh, press conference the other day, I think it's important to note while uh, there's a lot of very, very good news here, for both in terms of the general fund picture, the state picture, and uh, for particularly for Proposition 98 and education in total, uh, the governor was uh, adamant in pointing out some cautions, and uh, part of that was um, the continued existence of uh, future obligations that the state has to pay. Pay down. The governor also cautioned that our revenue system is still uh, very heavily reliant on capital gains, and uh, certainly the booming stock market is what's uh, helping us uh, for the uh, both the 13, 14, and 14, 15 year, as you'll uh, as you'll see. And also, we warned about the short-term nature of Proposition uh, 30. So, uh, starting in 2017, those revenues will begin to ramp down a little bit. So, uh, given all that, uh, he is. Uh, he, 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 pre he picture, uh, presents his budget as a very cautious picture relative to what he could have done uh, otherwise. So we'll, we'll go through some of those details now. Uh, in terms of education, uh, very, very, very good news for Proposition 98. Uh, relative to the enacted budget uh, approved for the 2013-14 year, there is 11.4 percent growth in the guarantee uh, projected to the 14-15 year. Uh, so that brings the total up to, uh, for, for K-14, up to $61.6 billion. Again, uh, that's a, a higher level than we were at in 2007-8 for the first time uh, in, the, in the intervening years. Uh, and also there's a significant one-time resources available as the, uh, as the guarantee was actually uh, underfunded for the, uh, some of the prior years. So with that, there's over $3 billion in one-time expenditures for uh, Prop 98 proposed to be uh, funded, uh, the governor primarily uses those resources to pay down the deferral obligations. 
for the 14-15 year, the uh, highlights uh, as they pertain to the community colleges are significant. Uh, the, the governor proposes 3% increase in access funds for the system. Uh, of a, that's, turns out, comes out to about $155 million. That, by my calculations, that will restore uh, seats for about 70,000 students on a headcount basis. Uh, there is a notable proposal that comes along with that, though. Uh, the governor does suggest that beginning in the 14-15 year, so uh, a lot of work would have to be done quickly if that proposal went through, as, uh, as he suggests. Uh, he would like the formula for local growth allocations to be weighted toward uh, uh, districts having uh, high levels of uh, unmet need in terms of their uh, educational needs. So again, there's not a lot of specificity uh, in the proposal as to what that means. He does ask the Board of Governors to come up with the regulation that would, uh, that would uh, uh, tease that out, but my sense is that uh, a key area of interest for him is uh, high levels of, um, uh, or rather low levels of educational attainment. He wants to make sure that those areas are getting uh, a greater share of growth than they would have otherwise. Uh, the governor does fund the statutory COLA for this year. Notably, it is, it is a very uh, small COLA. It's less than 1%. Uh, we do get about $48 million for that. Uh, as Chancellor Harris does says, the governor's uh, vision is pretty well, very well aligned with uh, that of this board's. Uh, he proposes $200 million to increase uh, student success programs and strengthen support for underrepresented students. Uh, 100 million of that uh, support would go into the student success and support program. Uh, so if, uh, if that, is a, that proposal is adopted, we'd have about $200 million in that program, whereas in 2012-13, uh, we only had only $50 million. So that is uh, rapid growth in a very high priority area for this board. Uh, additionally, the governor proposes $100 million uh, to uh, close uh, achievement gaps and access for underrepresented student groups as identified through their student equity plans. Uh, another ma major area of expenditure is $175 million for scheduled maintenance and instructional equipment. Uh, similar to the funds we received for those items in the 13-14 uh, uh, year, uh, the language <coughs> suggests that that's on a one-time basis, so that does not necessarily mean that we'll ex get the same level of expenditure uh, in an ongoing uh, manner, but that is uh, very good news. Uh, uh, as noted above, the governor would uh, formally retire the system's deferral obligations. Uh, again, two years ago, just prior to the passage of Prop uh, 30, we had $961 million in deferral obligations. Uh, in this proposal, we would be down to zero in less than two years. That's quite remarkable. Uh, we received $39 million this year in Proposition 39 funds. It's actually a slight decrease from what we had uh, in the current year. That's, that's uh, simply a result of uh, an estimate of decreased revenues uh, from the, the out-of-state corporations that generate that revenue. Uh, the governor also, I think, recognizes the uh, importance uh, of this office and the importance of uh, performance among our, um, our colleges by providing $2.5 million to provide local technical uh, assistance to support the implementation of effective practices in all districts with uh, a priority, priority being placed on underperforming districts. So that is, that is local assistance, Proposition 98 money for technical assistance. Uh, uh, concurrently, the governor proposes $1.1 million and, and uh, nine new positions for the chancellor's office to help establish performance standards and, and coordinate that, uh, that technical assistance with districts. So I think he's recognizing uh, the good work that uh, this board and that this office has been doing uh, over the past few years. Uh, in recent years, we've seen s several uh, proposals from the governor in terms of flexibility on categorical programs. Uh, the, the proposal in this budget would be to allow uh, Twenty-five percent of the funds in certain select categorical programs. I've since learned that those programs are EOPS, CalWORKs, and the Basic Skills Initiative could be diverted uh, from those programs to other uh, state, local, or federal uh, programs. And uh, the the goal, uh, as the governor has stated, is to uh, try to break down. I think some of the silos that we see in these programs, and to uh, have a, a more coordinated response that reflects local district uh, needs and uh, their populations. Uh, the governor also, uh, uh, you, you might recall in our system budget request, we had highlighted the issue of the uh, 
instability of the system's apportionment, whether through property taxes, RDAs, the EPA, that we often end the year with deficits because we have so much of our, uh, our budget is actually outside of the state uh, general fund. Uh, we, the governor does not go all the way towards proposing a continuous appropriation for us, which would be the ultimate solution, uh, but he does propose to stabilize the apportionment in several important ways. Uh, number one of which is that he does fund the cost of the EPA for us uh, the, the, from Proposition 30 that uh, requires us to fund every district at least $100 per FTS such that uh, we're funding basic aid districts um, uh, dollars that they would not have otherwise received. That, that was an obligation that had been unfunded for us in prior budgets. The governor proposes to fund that uh, cost for us this year and also to make up for the, uh, uh, the cost from the prior two years as well. Uh, additionally, the governor proposes changing the timeline <coughs> for determining the backfill of RDA revenues that we're scheduled to receive earlier in the year. Uh, that way we can hopefully come to a, uh, a resolution uh, before the fiscal year ends rather than having to figure it out uh, several months after the year closes. So we, we uh, certainly applaud those efforts to bring greater stability to our state apportionment. Uh, another major uh, area of expenditure of interest to us is the Innovative Models for Higher Education proposal. So this is a, a non-Prop 98 uh, expenditure. It's $50 million, a general fund that, uh, uh, that any campus could uh, apply for, whether a UC, CSU, or community college uh, uh, campus, to, uh, with the goal to come up with, to see in w uh, models of innovation that uh, work toward increasing the number of students earning bachelor's degrees uh, the number of students earning bachelor's degrees within four years and to ease the transfer be among the state's education system. So we're uh, very supportive of that proposal as well. Uh, notably, because uh, uh, the, the question has been already asked of me several times already, no, there is no proposal to increase fees in this budget. Uh, we did not see the similar proposals we have in prior years to require all students to um, uh, seeking uh, bog fee waivers to uh, fill out a, a FAFSA. Uh, there's no proposal on uh, changing the census date or funding on completion as we've seen in recent, recent years. Uh, so uh, by and large, this is very much a very, very positive budget for the community colleges. And uh, 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 we look forward to working with him and to, with the legislature on uh, implementing something very close to this. Um, there, are, there are a few areas of caution I'd like to point out. Uh, one of them is that the governor does speak to the uh, issue of the CalSTRS fund. There's an outstanding $80 billion uh, uh, deficit in, uh, in terms of the actuarial uh, <coughs> estimates on that over the next 30 years. Uh, so there's no specific proposal put on the table, but he does note that as commencing in the 15, 16 year, he wants to come up with a proposal to begin retiring that deficit. And he does mention that that would be a shared uh, contribution from uh, the public employers, from the uh, employees, and also the state. So that is something that will have to be on our radar is that is a very significant uh, uh, liability that's out there. Uh, some other areas of uh, concern. Uh, the governor mentions um, a proposal to smooth out uh, the state's uh, boom and bust cycle, so to speak, through a constitutional amendment. Uh, again, through his press comments, he saw again and again it came back to the issue of capital gains, how they zigzag up and down all the time and how that drives Proposition 98 in our in our uh, boom and bust budget cycles. Uh, his proposal, as I understand it, would, uh, for years in which the capital gains represent more than 6.5% of the total general fund, uh, fund, would move funds into uh, a rainy day fund uh, uh, that could uh, expand to up to 10% of the budget. And in years where uh, 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 dollars were less than that, they would be transferred out. Uh, particularly for Proposition 98, as I understand it, the implication for that would be that um, in, in down years, the rainy day funds would be used to make sure that uh, K-14 could, could provide at least growth in COLA uh, in those down years. So that is, that is the thinking. Obviously, a lot of details to be examined if and when we see a, a proposal in writing on that. We'll be carefully uh, monitoring that. So uh, again, in conclusion, uh, this is a very, very good budget that's very well aligned, I think, with this board's goals and priorities. Uh, we want to thank the governor for his uh, willingness to uh, uh, reinvest in higher education, uh, both in uh, community colleges and also with our partners at UC and CSU and in uh, K-12. And uh, 
while we're far from a final budget, uh, I think we could say that we're off to a pretty darn good start. Uh, the next uh, steps in the process will be the LEO is going to come out with their analysis. I understood it might even come out uh, sometime this afternoon. Uh, the legislature will have their hearings and they'll review the budget and of course May Revision will see a revised uh, revenue picture and uh, perhaps new proposals at that point on our way to a completed budget hopefully by June 30th. And with thank, that, thank I'll you, Vice Chair Troy. Uh, Member Reed? History has shown that as the economy recovers, uh, the, there's a lack of or drop in enrollment for the community colleges. It's a kind of an inverse relationship. And I've seen some numbers that show that potentially we could drop below even 2 million students this coming year. And I was wondering, are the colleges and all, how are they preparing to do the offsets with an increased budget uh, and yet maybe facing some enrollment shortfalls going forward? Is that going to have a major impact on, on our operations as a system? Well, I, I think it's uh, quite possible that maybe what we should do is in looking at this budget is seeing if uh, there isn't a more, um, uh, a different balance to the funds that are provided. For us, we have spent the last uh, couple of years working very heavily on student success uh, and trying to improve the quality uh, of instruction in our, in, uh, in our offerings. So it may be that the uh, funds provided for uh, enrollment here could be, uh, we could have a discussion with finance and the legislature about diverting some of those funds into uh, making sure that first we're uh, providing uh, quality instruction to the students that we do enroll rather than uh, ramping up too quickly on enrollment. I think the other thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that it, we turned away an, a large number of students during the downturn, and it's still uh, unclear how many of those students simply deferred their education and will be coming back to the institutions. In fact, the early numbers on the spring term are really uneven. Some of the institutions are struggling to uh, meet their enrollment targets. Others are seeing a really robust enrollment. So I think over the next several months uh, as this budget process is going forward, we'll get a more clear picture of what the enrollment's likely to look like. Any other questions from the members? Member Hawkins? Uh, thank you, President Bonka. Uh, Dan, the, uh, while I didn't expect to see professional growth, that was our board's request, our system request. The funding. Professional development. Right. Professional yeah. development, yes. The, would, would that potentially come out of the any money allocated for student success? Because that was one of the tied to the initiatives there. Is, is, is that a correct corollary? Yeah, yes. I, I think uh, particularly if you look at the $100 million the governor provides for the student equity plans, I think he might suggest that uh, that gives districts the room uh, if their local plans, local needs dictate that to, to spend some funds on professional development. That seems to be his take. It's certainly true, I think, that we've seen this in, in the governor's proposal with the, the LCFF for uh, K-12 and in his proposals for community colleges that he is uh, not terribly inclined to put money into the categorical programs. I think he views it as siloing the money. I think he'd like to see more of a coordinated uh, response with more local control over how those dollars are allocated. Number I have one last question. Um, with this tax increase that the taxpayers voted for, uh, do you see, when you, you mentioned in your comments about the fact that it's going to be ramping down in the next three years, uh, doesn't it absolutely go away at the end of the third year? And That's if, right. if it does go away, do you see any uh, uh, effort being put forth to, to uh, pass another similar type bill, or is it too early? Uh, yes, first off, the, uh, the sales tax portion of Prop 30 disappears on uh, January 1, 2017. That represents, I'll uh, eyeball it, about, of about 30% or 25% to 30% of the, of the revenues generated for Prop 30. And the income tax portion ends uh, two years later. And, uh, and as you suggest, uh, Prop 30 is temporary. They're, they're gone at that point. There's nothing in law that would continue it. Uh, now, will there be attempts? to continue it in some shape or form, I would certainly expect that that would be the case. In fact, uh, I know Superintendent Torlickson spoke out the other day about uh, the need to extend those, those uh, revenues. So I, I'm sure we'll see efforts, whether it comes from the governor or from uh, its external groups to, uh, to try to extend those. Any other questions, comments? 
Vice Chancellor uh, Troy, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for that update. We'll move on to state legis uh, state and federal legislative update uh, item uh, 3.2. Chancellor Harris. Thank you, President Baca, members of the board. I'm going to uh, ask uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart to approach the oh, podium. And I'm, I'm so sorry. There were some members of the public that wanted to address the board on that. On uh, uh, this one? Or on, the past on, one? On, on the past one. Okay. Yes. Hold off for just a moment. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry about Vice that. Uh, there were two members of the public who would All like right. to address the, the board on item 3.1. First is Jonathan Lightman from the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges, and my apologies to Mr. Lightman. But maybe you figured you knew what I was going to say, so you didn't want me to come. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Lightman on behalf of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges, thank you. And I, I obviously want to thank uh, the Governor of the Department of Finance, uh, Chancellor Harris, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Troy, for all the hard work in this proposal. And clearly, there's a lot of optimism moving forward. Um, I do want to say uh, on behalf of FAC that, that we do need to look at the intent language on SB 1456, which discussed the need to have part-time faculty support, particularly in the office hours, which we know is a contributor to student success, to increase the ratio of the full to the part-time faculty ratio, which is another contributor to student success. Right now it stands at 57%. Statewide goal is 75 percent to backfill and increase student services like EOPS and DSPS, which we know took a, a big beating in the budget crisis, and to add more counselors and to, in fact, lower that um, uh, student to counselor ratio. And while there are elements of this budget that we can work in that direction, frankly, we need support, more support from, from this body and from this office to push these items and to say to the legislature that we know what it takes not simply to front load student services, but to examine our students in a holistic manner and to say that there are many elements from the moment that they enter to the moment that they leave that contribute to student success. And those four would be at the top of our list. Also, we are very troubled by the 25% proposal on categorical flexibility I do want to thank uh, Vice Chancellors Troy and Skinner for uh, setting up um, a, a, a communication with the um, Department of Finance. And, and I asked them, I said, so if, if we are going to move monies, are, are EOPS, DSPS, and CalWORKs, are they the beneficiaries of this money or are they actually the target? And the response was, well, they could be both. And frankly, if our goal is to assist in underrepresented students, these programs have their own infrastructure for a reason. They have their own history and they have a demonstrated track record of success. And what we do need to do is to continue to support these programs, but also to make sure that the hemorrhaging that occurred during the fiscal downturn is reversed now that we have more money at our disposal. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next is Richard Hansen from the Community College Independence. My comments are quite similar to Jonathan's. I represent faculty in the independent unions throughout the system. And I want to thank also what the Chancellor's Office has been able to do in terms of getting this budget where it is so far. Uh, but I'd make the same plea that the uh, faculty items be part of student success. Uh, we just finished a debate over at-risk students and the need for assistance for them to get through the uh, ups and downs of the VOG fee waiver process. This requires full-time counselors, and that needs to be a part of the proposal. Uh, the governor, bu governor's, governor's budget now, I think, allow, would allow for that, to increase the number of full-time counselors. Uh, but we as a system need to advocate for that and then make it part of our plan moving forward. Um, beyond that, too, Jonathan mentioned, <coughs> um, full-time faculty numbers. Uh, our ratio goal is to be at 75% of instruction in the hands of full-time faculty. Uh, during these bad years, that actually went down. It's a bit counterintuitive. We were hovering for the last decade or so at about 63%. Now we're down more to about 55% from the data that was given to us at the last consultation council meeting back in November. Um, that's troubling. So uh, 
our group would very much like to see us make that a priority too, to make progress toward the 75% goal, certainly get back to where we were, and then have a plan moving forward to improve. Full-time faculty are uh, an asset to student success. But in, at the same time, part-time faculty are also a component, very important one. Office hours is essentially a no-brainer. They should uh, be compensated for holding office hours for their students. Uh, but beyond that, we need to move forward on what we called parity uh, about a decade ago, and that is to really professionalize the part-time ranks and have them be able to be on campus more and more involved in campus activities and provide greater stu uh, um, services to students. Um, I'd like to also mention, uh, I, I appreciated your <coughs> response, uh, Chan uh, Vice Chancellor Troy, to the question about the uh, declines in enrollment because we're not really in the boom period anymore. We, we're in a new reality. But in fact, if the legislature wants us to um, succeed in terms of student success, uh, the mindset has to move from simply growth <coughs> to that issue of quality. And all of what I just outlined, uh, that's what that's about. And there are going to be districts that are struggling uh, with enrollment. Uh, they need to be restored as well to where they were before. May not be at the same enrollment numbers, but their budgets need to be um, brought back to normal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I just had a question because I, I was interested in the 7520 rule for uh, 7525 rule since I came to the board, and it's, it appeared to me that that those waivers and all were more accepted because we were in such economic dire times, if you will. Do you see that correcting itself as a, as a result of a better economic environment that the colleges in general will go back to full-time hiring? Or I, I think that would uh, somewhat put me in the position of speculating how colleges will handle their, their uh, hiring practices, but I do know that in November the board uh, voted to uh, ensure that the, uh, the uh, full-time faculty obligation number uh, would be put into into play for the following year. It had been frozen for the last uh, few years due to the economic downturn. So, uh, full t so faculty number will have to increase by the amount of uh, full time uh, uh, credit FTS that they take on over the next year. So uh, that 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 figure should be moving in a positive direction. Very good. Thank you very much, Chancellor. We'll move on to item three point two. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart to come to the podium, and, and again, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, his work and his team's work, not only at the state level, but on the upcoming uh, federal national legislative sum summit that will be held next month in Washington, D.C. So, uh, Vince? Great. Thank you, Chancellor Harris and uh, President Baca, members of the board. Um, this month's uh, state and federal legislative update is an informational item and, and therefore will be relatively brief, especially given where we are in the legislative session. I um, would like to begin with the state update and as is customary, the summary and status uh, reports of the legislation we're tracking have been included in your uh, board packets. Um, in terms of where we are in tr uh, uh, the process with the legislature, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the legislature reconvened on January 6th and uh, has commenced with uh, committee hearings. They're primarily working through their calendar of uh, two-year bills that must be passed out of their House of Origin by January 31st, and we're certainly monitoring and following that process. Um, in terms of our package of sponsored legislation, which we discussed in November, we're certainly moving that forward. We've uh, developed legislative language and are currently talking with a number of potential authors about moving uh, those uh, into introduction by the February 21st deadline for introducing new bills. There is, uh, however, one newly introduced bill that I would like to call to your attention, and this is uh, SB 850 by Senator Marty Block. Some of you might have heard about this bill. Uh, it is uh, legislation that would grant authority to the California Community Colleges to offer the applied baccalaureate degree. Um, I would like to point out that the current version of the bill in print, I think, is really a starting point and one to serve as a catalyst to move a discussion forward on this issue. Uh, Chancellor Harris and Deputy Chancellor Skinner and myself met with the Senator last week. I think we had a very good conversation and we did commit uh, to him uh, to continue working with him as well as members of the legislature and our colleagues at the UC and the CSU 
to hopefully arrive at a policy outcome that we can all uh, live with. I think uh, this is an issue that uh, folks clearly have very strong opinions and, and uh, those have already started to emerge. Um, in terms of the federal uh, legislative update, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, in December, the President and Congress reached a compromise on a budget agreement uh, which averted a government shutdown and uh, some of the, uh, uh, some relief rather, from sequestration. Uh, we'll continue to monitor some of the ongoing conversations around the budget, particularly as those that relate to an extension of uh, unemployment benefits. Um, in addition to the bills that are summarized in your agenda, I'd like to point out there have been a couple of new introductions here in the last uh, week or so, uh, one in the Senate uh, dealing with uh, student loan default rates uh, and one in the House on uh, higher education tax rates. Uh, we'll be going through those and providing summaries of those bills in your future federal updates. Uh, and as President Baca mentioned, uh, in February, I believe be beginning on the 10th, uh, the National Legislative Summit of Community Colleges will be kicking off, <coughs> and I know that some of you will be attending that conference, so we are uh, preparing information around the advocacy agenda and the meetings that we will be scheduling for uh, folks participating on the Hill and with the administration. Um, lastly, I would like to re reiterate the reminder from Chancellor Harris that we are sponsoring a uh, legislative reception, uh, uh, co-hosting actually with the CSU for new UC President Janet Napolitano uh, tomorrow evening, and we are certainly hopeful that uh, all of you can attend. I know many of you have already RSVP'd, and if you need more information about that, uh, please feel free to, to let me know. Um, rather than, than walking through the bills that are in your agenda, I thought I'd probably stop there and take any questions that you might have. Member Belansky? Could you say more about this AB 675? Because I'm not understanding that at all just by reading it, the employment of faculty and determining faculty. Certainly so. <coughs> and I believe that summary was likely drafted before amendments that I believe were, were proposed to that bill. As I understand it, it deals with um, the calculation of service credits and particularly as it relates to faculty who may be going out on maternity leave and ensuring that there's some balance and, and equity there. And the only other one is the, uh, since there is a bill, is there thought being given to how to deal with it on the Community College Differential Funding Work Group? There is. I know that uh, I had participated in a meeting with Vice Chancellor Tom Quinlivan where that issue had come up, um, and I think we're looking at a, a variety of, of possible approaches to dealing with that issue. I think, quite honestly, we'll need to look at that legislation more closely and, and suggest, I think, some, some alternatives that are perhaps more consistent with where we have been historically. I do think the other footnote to that uh, is the, with the uh, support proposed by the governor for enrollment uh, and the restoration of access, that the need for differential funding may be uh, somewhat less compelling than it was earlier. So I was even wondering how you would define which courses are high demand and high credit cost. Who makes that decision? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the comments, uh, Vice Chancellor Stewart. Thank you very much. Look forward to uh, your arrangements for Washington D.C. Vince, remind the board what time tomorrow afternoon. The, uh, is it five o'clock? The uh, reception will run from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Thank Citizen you. Hotel. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will move on to item 3.3, uh, Foundation of California Community Colleges Work-Based Learning Initiatives, building on our strengths. Chancellor. Thank you. I will uh, turn this uh, part of the presentation over to Keith Mills, the leader of the Community College Foundation. And, uh, going to take you through some slides and provide you, I think you'll find a very informative update. Thank you, Chancellor Harris, uh, President Baca, members of the board. Uh, so today I will be talking a little bit about uh, workforce or work-based learning initiatives that are happening at the foundation in partnership with the uh, Chancellor's Office. And uh, I will be speaking from this particular PowerPoint, which I think that you have in front of you there on your desks. Um, so I think, you know, I'll just start by saying I think we're all aware of the, the workforce challenges that 
uh, we're facing not only in our state but throughout our nation. Uh, there are studies that show that almost 40 percent of U.S. employers uh, report difficulty finding staff with the right skills, and 92 percent of top executives report there's a skill set skills <laughs> gap, with 44 percent identifying soft skills as the most important gap. I think we all also know that the California Community Colleges are really leading the way in helping to address some of these uh, workforce development issues. We are the largest provider of work, uh, workforce training in, the, in both our state and in the nation. And under the leadership of Vice Chancellor Vontan Quinlevin, we're now working under a new um, framework that's entitled Doing What Matters for Jobs and the Economy that's really designed um, to enhance our role in making sure that we are offering skills-based training that are really focused on those in-demand skills to help uh, kind of bridge the gap between uh, what employers are saying they're needing um, and what their potential employees, uh, the skills that they're coming out with. Uh, the foundation has been involved in workforce development really since our inception. Uh, beginning in 1998 when we were formed, uh, we've operated a career pathway internship placement program. Uh, since 2004, we've done some more targeted work both in the air quality technician training area and in healthcare. And with the rollout of the Doing What Matters program in 2013, uh, we were named as a technical assistance provider for that program uh, for uh, the provision of, of paid internships. So we're a key partner uh, within that initiative. And just recently, uh, in the fourth quarter of 2013, uh, we announced a, a new investment uh, made by J.P. Morgan Chase to launch an employer engagement program. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. So I want to just start talking a little bit more about our Career Pathway Internship Placement Program. Um, this particular program is funded through partnerships with both public and private employers. Uh, we partner with employers to provide um, all back office kind of HR services uh, for paid internships. And since inception of this program, we've employed over 3,000 college students in paid internship opportunities. And that includes over 120 actually here at the foundation um, and in uh, chancellor's office position so we're also uh, walking the walk uh, with these uh, the importance of paid internships so you know this program is really important because it really works to provide life-shaping opportunities for these students um, these students receive real-world experience that's directly related to their field of study uh, they receive income that helps them stay in school these are paid internships uh, they receive an expansion of their professional network. They're in the workplace and they're building their professional network while they're still in school. And they have the potential uh, for full-time career opportunities through these internships. And in fact, uh, studies show that over 60% of students who participate in a paid internship receive at least one job offer uh, at the end of their study. This program is really um, also important for employers. So what we're trying to do is, is trying to make it as simple as possible for employers to create internship opportunities within their operations and actually hire uh, paid student interns. So the services that we offer are really comprehensive back office HR services. Um, we give them access to a number of colleges so that the employer doesn't have to go out and enter into contracts with each individual uh, college. They can come through us and we're the conduit to a number of colleges. It's really important to us here that we're not replacing that relationship between the local employer and the college, <coughs> but we're facilitating that relationship with the employer and the college and getting more colleges connected with their local employers. This gives them uh, the, the employers more access uh, to qualified students with the more colleges that they're able to partner with. It really creates a, a talent pipeline um, within the organization. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to reduce the barriers for employers uh, to hire more interns. And this is a, a quote here from one of our uh, private, sorry, public sector uh, partners where uh, they say that the foundation's professional responsive service helps our student assistant program run smoothly. The staff responds quickly to any issues that arise, making my job easier. And that's what we're trying to do. 
Um, we've talked before about our Career Pathway Internship Placement Program and that it's been historically heavily focused on the public sector and you can see here a list of, of entities that we've engaged with and uh, we talked about a year ago um, about some issues that we had with the program uh, with a agreement that was signed between the governor and, and the labor union and there was some confusion around the work that the student internships were doing as it relates to, uh, to, to union employees. And so we've really spent the last year um, trying to figure out how do we take this experience that we've gained, um, you know, employing 3,000 students over the last, you know, 15 years and how do we rebuild this um, both with the, the private sector, the public sector business and the private sector uh, uh, employers as well. So over the last year we've really been trying to poise ourselves for expansion through aligning with the Doing What Matters program, uh, really brainstorming how do we engage more private sector employee, employers and which private sector employers are the right ones to engage. How can we enhance our back office platform to make it even easier for employers to participate. Um, and then we've recently launched a partnership with the Link Learning Alliance uh, that will allow us to expand uh, these work-based learning experiences uh, to high school students as well. And that was made possible by the uh, J.P. Morgan grant, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, in addition to our kind of overall student, uh, Career Pathway Student Internship Placement Program, we've been focused in, uh, in, a, in a couple of areas um, uh, a little bit more deep. Um, one is our air quality technician training program. This is a really cool program that is um, funded through a partnership with the Bureau of Automotive Repair. And this is a great example of another state agency uh, having the obligation to provide a service to the community, not really having the, the skills or resources uh, to be able to provide that service, and looking to the community colleges as a resource to be able to provide that service on, on their behalf. And, uh, and they work with the foundation as the conduit uh, to about 30 California community colleges colleges throughout our state. So these 30 California community colleges not only um, uh, have space that is leased uh, from them from the Bureau of Automotive Repair, but they have equipment on site uh, that allows us to run a, a, um, a, a student training program there on site. We've trained over a thousand students since 2004 in this program. Uh, these students leave the program uh, with a smog check technician certification. Uh, they also get work-based credit, um, and so they're, they're receiving college credit for the time that they spend in this program, and of course leave with expanded employment opportunities in the automotive field. Similar with the smog check training program, um, we've also run a program for a number of years that digs a little bit deeper into the nursing um, industry. And this is a great program um, that was originally seed funded through philanthropy. Uh, so the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation uh, made a philanthropic grant back in 2004 that allowed us to kind of build uh, this platform and this infrastructure and we're now sustaining it today through um, nationwide expansion and subscription dues. So a perfect example of philanthropy seeding a program that we've now turned into a self-sustaining uh, business model. And since 2004 through this program, we've literally placed hundreds of thousands of nursing students at clinical cl uh, training sites. And we do this through a technology tool. It's entitled the Centralized Clinical Placement System. And it's a matching technology that helps match nursing students in nursing schools um, with, uh, with clinical sites to provide that hands-on training. So that includes about 140 nursing students in California and about 430 nursing students nationwide. Um, in California, we are uh, working with about 58 schools of nursing and 62 clinical agency sites and nationwide, which really allows us to uh, make this program uh, sustainable and keep the cost very low for our California contingents. Uh, we have about eight regional markets where we work with 179 nursing schools and 175. Uh, clinical sites and this is a really great quote from a um, uh, an industry magazine modern healthcare uh, where they did an interview with us on this particular platform and they report that our nursing resource center provides an infrastructure that fosters greater collaboration and convergence of the entire nursing community within a region with the common goal of increasing capacity in the clinical setting and in the classroom 
So we're really excited to talk about this new project that uh, we've re recently launched in the fourth quarter of uh, 2014. I talked earlier about uh, this project has been funded by a uh, $1.2 million grant from the J.P. Morgan Chase Philanthropy Board, and the grant was made to the foundation in partnership with the Link Learning Alliance. So it's really helping us create uh, this really formidable partnership with Link Learning. Um, the program is really meant to build on our existing strength through the Career Pathway Internship Placement Program. Um, it aligns with the work of uh, doing what matters with jobs in the economy. It also helps to build on our, expert, uh, our expertise in building technology tools uh, to help match students. So it kind of takes all of these components of what we've been doing over the last 15 years um, and create um, something bigger and broader that we hope will turn into um, a statewide platform for all of our colleges to use. We're really excited about our partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase. I know you've heard me talk about J.P. Morgan on a number of occasions. They are currently managing our endowments that total over $80 million, and they're doing that at um, uh, really significantly discounted rates, and we've been really happy with that service. Um, they've also supported the Veterans Summit since the inception of that summit. So for the last three years, they've been the lead sponsor uh, for the Veterans Summit, which you heard President Baca talk about, I think, at the inception of, of this meeting. And this most recent investment really kind of raised the bar on their investment in the California community colleges, where they've now made an investment of over a million dollars that is for um, a, a one-year period. And, and we're hoping that that investment will, um, will continue on. Um, this particular investment that J.P. Morgan has made is part of a recently launched um, global philanthropic initiative that they're calling New Skills at Work. And they're investing about $250 million on a global level uh, to create economic opportunity to address both unemployment and the skills gap. And our project, I think, fits really nicely into their initiative in that um, you know, we're building a demand-driven system uh, where we're trying to increase collaboration between employers uh, and, and colleges. Um, you know, they're investing in the best training uh, through this recent initiative with the Doing What Matters. We're making sure that we're aligning our, our training um, with the priority in emerging sectors um, and, and really producing the skills that are needed. And those are the types of programs that J.P. Morgan wants to invest in. They're also very interested in data, so our technology tool fits really nicely into that. Um, and we're focusing on building a tool that not only helps match the students with employers, but also acts as a data gathering and data um, analysis tool as well. Um, we're equally excited about our recent partnership with the Link Learning Alliance. And if you're not familiar with uh, Link Learning Alliance, they are a, a statewide coalition of education, industry, and community organizations. Um, and they're really de dedicated to preparing students um, for basically college, career, and life. And their philosophies are, are focused on both rigorous academics um, <coughs> coupled with kind of hands-on um, work-based learning experience to prepare um, high school students for, for success. And our partnership with Link Learning, um, they're taking the lead role in helping us expand our efforts um, to include high school students. And they're also taking a lead role in helping with the development of the technology tools so that we can build a statewide platform that not only serves our, our community college students, uh, but that can also uh, work with the Link Learning Alliance for providing high school work-based learning um, experiences. So the goal of this $1.2 million one-year grant is uh, in the fall of 2014 to be in a position to launch a comprehensive work-based learning pilot program in Sacramento. Uh, and we hope to reach 500 students here in, in Sacramento, and that includes both high school and college students. Uh, we're going to hold a number of employer convenings. Uh, we're going to work on expanding our career pathway internship program to provide uh, enhanced tools, and then, of course, develop and uh, implement the technology tool. Um, so over the next several months, we'll be holding employer convenings uh, primarily here in Sacramento that are focused on the priority and emergent sectors that are identified in the Doing What Matters initiative. So in Sacramento, that includes health, advanced manufacturing, and information and communication technology. And what we want to accomplish through these employer convenings is to, to not only uh, raise awareness and 
uh, and make sure employers understand the importance of, of paid internships, but actually get them to sign on the dotted line, to utilize the platform, and to create student internship uh, programs within their operations. Um, from a programmatic infrastructure perspective, uh, we'll be continuing to look at our career pathway program and determine what additional tools uh, can we implement and build uh, and provide to employers to help them sign up for this program. So we'll be using the employer convenings to do some brainstorming and get some best practices. Um, we'll be building toolkits that if we can identify best practices that are happening in certain entity uh, industries, uh, what we want to do is build tools so that uh, the other employers don't have to recreate the wheel, that they can take what the best practices of what's already working and apply that in their operations. And finally, the technology tool, we've talked a little bit about this, that um, it basically we'd like to build the match.com uh, for student internships where it makes it uh, a lot easier for uh, the students to connect with, uh, with the employers. We're also talking about integrating a badging system so that as students make their way through work-based learning, especially as they're coming up and doing uh, high school work-based learning and then transitioning into community college, uh, paid internships, uh, there are certain skills that they, were get, they will gain along the way and if we can track those through some sort of badging system to show, you know, I'm at this point along the way uh, in work-based learning, we think that would be really uh, valuable both to the student and to the um, employer. Um, and then, of course, we're, we're wanting to kind of manage um, this data centrally so that we can create a statewide platform uh, that not, not only works to employ 500 students in Sacramento, but that works to employ thousands of students statewide uh, that eventually all 112 community colleges can uh, patch into with their local employers to uh, provide a statewide system. So that is our uh, ultimate goal. So um, in, in the long term, you know, what we're looking for, again, is like what I talked about with the nursing investment, is to take this $1.2 million philanthropic investment and build something that can be self-sustainable and that can grow into the, long, uh, into the long term that basically results in more employers providing work-based learning experiences, uh, improve both quality and capacity of student internship opportunities that are out there. Uh, with employers and more tools and better infrastructure so we can scale to the statewide level. Um, if you guys are aware of employers, potential employers, both in Sacramento or in your local communities that might be interested in providing student internships but may not know how to get started, please let us know. Uh, this particular pilot is starting in Sacramento, but the services that we provide, uh, there are baseline services that are available now. Um, and we uh, are happy to get on the road and, and meet with folks at your local college and your local employers to talk to them both about, uh, you know, help us, helping us pilot this program and also uh, just getting their feet wet and providing paid internships. So uh, please let us know if you uh, have any of those contacts. And lastly, um, I would like to um, say uh, a big thank you to Member Ramos uh, for his work in uh, helping to make uh, initial introductions uh, to J.P. Morgan Chase that uh, I think that initial uh, introduction was three or four years ago and it's, uh, it's grown into a really meaningful investment in the California Community Colleges. So thank you for that introduction. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, uh, President Mills. And indeed, you know, um, this, this uh, kind of effort is critically important to transition students into the workplace and to uh, higher and different levels of employment. Uh, but uh, especially uh, very appreciative of our corporate sponsorships and, uh, and, and the kind of engagement that, that in, and success that you're having with that. So thank you very much for your, your work and the work of others. Member Volansky? Yeah, thank you very much. How do colleges get involved in this? Yeah, so um, the best thing to do is, is if you have a college that you, that, uh, that you know is interested to let us know and we'll get in contact with them through, we have a program manager and then our HR uh, director helps manage the program as well. Right now what's happening is that uh, colleges are getting involved through our work with the Doing What Matters program. So um, Vaughn and her group are on the road quite a bit with conferences and um, and things talking about the different components of doing what matters. Because we're a technical assistance provider, we are part of that. And so we talk about um, the services that we provide in connection with her conferences. And that's how we get a lot of interest um, from colleges. And so we've spent a lot of time over the last year um, 
talking both in group settings with colleges and then individually with colleges who do individual follow-up on, on these services. But to make it really successful, you need not only a college that's interested, but you, uh, you, know, you, need, you need the employer community um, interest as well. Um, and so that's kind of the next step is once we find an interested college, then we work with that college to identify, okay, who are your local employers who are best um, primed to participate in helping kind of um, make those connections and bridge those conversations. But any college that's interested could c connect with the foundation. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Member Sumi. First of all, thank you very much, President Mills, for an excellent presentation as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to follow up on Member Belansky's uh, question, in, uh, just at a, maybe a little bit uh, more in the weeds level, in terms of the Match.com uh, 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 reference you made. Uh, how do you outreach to individual students to, so that they are aware of the opportunities with these employers so that you get that right match uh, between uh, you know, students and their interests and the employers and their interests? Yeah, that's a great question, um, you know, and I think we're still kind of working through some of those details, but I think, you know, a key piece of that is having partnerships with the, the colleges and with uh, the college's career centers, uh, because a lot of times uh, the college will have career centers where they'll, they'll do postings um, and help us make those connections. I think there's also, um, you know, a number of other online tools uh, that are really helpful. So I, I don't think we expect that our kind of, uh, that our launch path technology tool will be the only place uh, for students to come. We think it will um, will likely also leverage other uh, kind of job posting boards uh, that are out there to help um, uh, attract students. So what we want to do is try to cast uh, the net wide so that we can attract as many students as, as possible. But I think it, it, it definitely starts with the college and, and with their career center and then expands from there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, uh, Vice President Bond? Uh, uh, going to Member Belinsky's uh, comment, um, how is the distribution of participation? Do Southern California institutions participate at a same or lower rate in some of these programs than Northern California institutions? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, in the nursing program, it is distributed fairly evenly. Um, we have uh, a large contingent in Southern California in the LA region and then a large contingent in, um, in the Bay Area region. Uh, we are currently lacking here in Sacramento. It's a difficult region because there's not an existing consortium, but we're still trying to crack that nut. Um, I think in the Bureau of Automotive Repair, it's, um, it is a statewide service, so it's very well dispersed um, throughout the state. So there are 30 centers uh, that basically provide the statewide service, and they do that through our community colleges, so there's representation um, statewide. For our Career Pathway program, it's been really heavily focused in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. um, our pilot is in Sacramento. It was kind of a, you know, it was the low-hanging fruit. It was, you know, that's what we're familiar with, and it was a good place to start. Uh, but the idea is to build something that can then, um, you know, be used statewide. And through our, um, our work with the Doing What Matters program, uh, we've been uh, meeting with a lot of colleges really throughout the state. I think on Friday there was a group out at, at Fresno City College um, talking about opportunities there. I know we've been to Santa Ana College. And so I think um, we're starting to, uh, you know, expand outside of California, um, and we're hoping that that will result in more and more placements. I'm sorry outside of Sacramento, and we're hoping that that will result in more and more placements, uh, both in Sacramento and uh, statewide. That's good to know. And then also, just going back to the, the fundraising side of it, how are you able to, uh, you, uh, you had the introduction from Member Ramos, but to get J.P. Morgan mm -hmm. to make a significant investment in community colleges, it, it, uh, were we part of their kind of philanthropic profile, or how did that uh, develop, and then how can we get other institutions and individuals and foundations to see community colleges as a target for their philanthropic engagement? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, fundraising, it's, uh, it's a lot of art <laughs> to fundraising, and it starts with an introduction by uh, member Ramos, and then as we uh, cultivate that relationship, it results in another introduction to uh, someone here in, uh, in San I remember Ramos' introduction was to someone in Southern California, and then we made our way to uh, someone uh, out of the Bay Area, out of the San Francisco office, and, um, 
It was a series of meetings. We just kept talking to our contacts about here are the things that are happening in California Community Colleges. I think we pitched kind of three or four different ideas and this workforce development one was the one that stuck. Uh, and it stuck so much that they got excited about it uh, in that they then made an introduction to their national folks um, out of New York and we're now, we've now um, had two to three meetings uh, with their global leadership. So it's, you know, some of it is, some of it is skill, some of it is art, some of it is just darn luck. <laughs> have they always managed the endowment? Uh? They have since inception. They okay. have uh, managed the endowment. And, and I think, you know, they are separate entities, but mm -hmm. that it's certainly been helpful to have those other relationships within the organization to help us. I think the, the relationship with our investment management folks helped us bridge from the Southern California relationship to the Bay Area relationship, to the national mm -hmm. relationship. And so, so much of fundraising is about, about relationship building, cultivating those donors, staying, helping them stay abreast of what we're doing, um, and also us researching what they're interested in so that we can help kind of help them make that, make that match. But I will say that um, I think workforce development issues are a, a hot topic now across the board, um, and we're finding that there are a number of um, kind of funding opportunities that are coming available that fit nicely into the work that we're doing and, and maybe not, you know, kind of the whole package, but maybe parts and pieces. Um, and so we think there could be um, a, a lot of opportunity to attract additional funders um, into this space so that we can expand, um, you know, on a more rapid pace. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very good. Are there any other comments uh, from members or questions? None. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you. We will now move on to uh, item 3.4. I can afford uh, college financial aid awareness campaign update and review of uh, redesigned website. Chancellor. Thank you, President Baca. Members of the board, uh, at this time, Vice uh, Chancellor Feast is going to uh, give the board a uh, quick update on the um, I Can Afford College campaign, which has been going on for a lot longer than I realized. So I'll, uh, rather than steal their thunder, I'll let uh, Paul and Paige uh, give you a, a quick update as they bring that up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, President Baca and, and board members. Uh, yes, the, the I Can Afford College campaign is now 10 years old, and uh, the re it started in the uh, year 2003-2004 when uh, student fees went up uh, rather considerably, and the legislature and governor were concerned that uh, even though fees were relatively low at the time and remain so, that uh, the increase would um, uh, put uh, community colleges out of reach, out of the reach of uh, low-income and disadvantaged students. So at the time, there was uh, $2.8 million dedicated as a continuous appropriation to provide uh, outreach and marketing uh, to make students aware that financial aid is available to them to pay for fees, uh, books, and sometimes even housing. Um, the amount that has been appropriated every year has not changed. It's uh, remained at $2.8 million. Uh, so, as you can imagine, we've had some significant erosion of the purchasing power of the campaign. Just as, as an example, uh, we are able to buy 36 percent fewer radio ads today than we were 10 years ago. But thanks to um, some very creative staff and contractors, uh, we have um, really stretched these dollars as, as far as they can go and leveraged in-kind in contributions, uh, built up partnerships up and down the state and made the, uh, the campaign a success. Um, there are uh, 2.5 million uh, students have visited the I Can Afford College website over the past 10 years. And uh, there's been, during the, the time that the campaign has been up, there's been a 70% increase in the number of students who 
um, are applied for and received financial aid. The key key uh, target mess the key key target audience rather are um, high school juniors, low income high school uh, juniors and seniors, uh, recent high school graduates, and uh, influencers such as coaches, uh, counselors, and parents. The main uh, the, the main focus of the campaign is to drive students uh, to the ICanAffordCollege.com website, which is a bilingual uh, English-Spanish uh, site that, uh, in detail, tells students uh, what type of uh, financial aid is available, uh, provides direct links to the um, applications, and uh, also includes contact information for where they can go on their local campus to receive one-on-one -on -one, uh, help. The uh, creative ad campaign uh, features a number of strategies, uh, most prominently radio, uh, there's television, video, mainly digital video. Uh, uh, actual broadcast television is, is very expensive and not really within the budget that we now have. But we do a lot of uh, online digital uh, advertising and I'm gonna play for you right here a, uh, one of the, the ads, one of the jingles that, that runs on the air. At the California Community Colleges, financial aid is available year-round to pay for fees, books, supplies, and sometimes even help with the rent. Find out how to get your financial aid at ICanAffordCollege.com. So that's just an example of one of the radio ads that, that plays uh, in markets throughout California. Um, and the, 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 the message in the campaign has been uh, really so effective at reaching the target audience that uh, we were recently approached by uh, a major Hollywood f film studio uh, who is interested in partnering with us to cross-promote our products. They have a, um, a, a big film release coming out later this year, and we're in negotiations with them about how we can cross-promote both the film and the campaign. Um, if you were watching the Golden Globe Awards last night, you probably saw two of the stars that will be fe uh, featured in that film. Um, and we're also uh, uh, changing our website. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Paige Mar my, my colleague Paige Marlette Dorr. Uh, when she uh, first joined us uh, 10 years ago, she was a contractor who actually designed this campaign. And now we're fortunate to have Paige on staff full time, and she's been working very closely on the uh, website redesign and some other activities. Thank you, Paul. And um, to, to Paul's point, when we were contacted by the major motion picture company, I asked them specifically, how did you hear about the California Community College's I Can Afford College campaign? And the person that I was talking with said, are you kidding me? Who hasn't heard about I Can Afford College? <laughs> and there was a pause in the conversation, and I thought he was being um, smart with me, and I kind of waited for the next shoe to drop. And he said, everybody walks around our office in Los Angeles humming the tune, I Can Afford College dot com. So <laughs> we feel like our advertising campaign has been pretty effective. Um, the ad campaign has been on in 18 markets throughout the state, and our key period for when we advertise uh, really starts soon, in February, and it goes through um, mid-June to early July. Generally, what we do in February is, um, is uh, talk to um, high school students about the Cal Grant campaign and make them aware about the fact that Cal Grants are available and the March 2nd deadline. Uh, prior to working with the California Community Colleges, I worked at an ad agency here in town on the Cal Grant campaign it, with the California Student Aid Commission, and that campaign has been so successful in branding the March 2nd deadline, it was somewhat difficult to jump over to this position because when we were out talking to our primary target audience, what we heard was, if I missed the March 2nd deadline, I can't apply for financial aid. They thought that there was that deadline and that all aid had a March 2nd deadline. So for the last 10 years, we've worked 
um, very diligently to let our students know that to maximize the amount of aid you get, you should apply by that March 2nd deadline, but that if you miss the deadline, there are still other opportunities for aid and that you should continue. So that leads into our April period, which is Financial Aid Awareness Month, and then we immediately go into high school graduation. Uh, we also have um, a very robust outreach campaign. We reach out to high schools and we participate in events like um, high school football games, rallies on lunch, um, and high school college fairs. We also work with the community colleges on their events. Sometimes it's their external events where they do outreach to their local high schools and communities, and sometimes it's internal events where we provide materials and support for um, new student barbecues to make sure that they're aware or new student tours or um, high school campus tours. We also participate in community events working with the 112 colleges and our 69 centers. Um, we either provide materials or sometimes staff booths ourself, ourselves. And some of the places that we're at are places like farmers markets, um, concerts throughout the state that are teen targeted, um, we do county fairs, um, and then we participate in major events like the LA Cash for College event, the Festival de la Familia here in Sacramento, um, Project Grad in Los Angeles, and um, with an organization called the Coalition of Youth. And we do that through a variety of methods. Sometimes it is um, actually hosting our own event or creating a, an event for these organizations, and sometimes it's just providing materials for them to distribute at these events. We also have a uh, targeted media relations campaign, and uh, what we've switched to this last year that we found to be pretty, is pretty uh, effective is creating template articles that we distribute to the more than 2,200 high schools in California that they can run in their student newspapers around those key time frames of Cal Grant, Financial Aid Awareness Month, and high school graduation, letting students know about the financial aid opportunities available. We also provide template articles for community-based organizations' newsletters and faith-based organization newsletters, also for high school newsletters. And uh, we've hosted some bloggers summits where um, we will do a webcast and invite bloggers from around the state to participate and learn more about the campaign and ask questions. Um, and then we also provide newsletters for um, students, high school counselors, community college financial aid offices, and community and faith-based organizations to use in their outreach efforts. We've had um, some exciting partnerships through the, throughout the last 10 years. We have a really great partner in Clear Channel Communications. One of the vice presidents um, that's very high up with Clear Channel is actually a community college graduate from here in California. And he has been extremely supportive of the campaign since um, we launched it in 2004. And some of the things that we've done to get students excited about and to visit the I Can Afford College website is um, put together prom uh, promotions with Clear Channel where they provide all of the prizes um, and give us additional promotional support in, in addition to what we purchased through them. So we've had campaigns like a free ride to college where Clear Channel worked with one of their partners to donate a car um, to the winner. We've had promotions where uh, students or p potential students can visit our website and submit a 30-second video telling uh, us about why they think financial aid is important and how it can help them, and then we invite uh, folks from throughout California to vote on which video is best, and we air it at the statewide Wango Tango concert. We've had the American Idol Be a Star Go to College promotion where we worked with American Idol. They promoted it on uh, their TV show. The radio stations promoted it, and the winner got to actually attend um, a taping of American Idol as well as um, receive a $5,000 scholarship to use toward community college fees, book supplies, and other living expenses. Um, we had a TMZ Be a Paparazzi for a Day sort of work-based promotion. And uh, most recently, we had a Twitter essay contest to engage more of our students in social media and um, use Twitter and Facebook to tell us why financial aid is important to them. And then uh, we selected a winner, and the winner won $5,000. And the, se the second place winner won a um, fully loaded iPad to use for classes. 
We've had on the campaign um, Star Power uh, helping to promote it. Through our relationship with Clear Channel Communications, we have used Ryan Seacrest at no cost to uh, record commercials for the campaign, talking about the importance of financial aid. We've had Will I Am do the same, uh, as well as Nick Cannon. And then we used Ed Crane to do outreach to the influencer audience and to um, run some ads on talk radio stations throughout the state. We've also participated in the iHeart Radio Festival, um, free of charge to us through Clear Channel and Wango Tango, which is the state's largest concert and has um, thousands and thousands of uh, participants. We've had our ads aired there as well as um, booths where we can give out information and have the students directly connected to our website. Uh, the campaign has also been involved in Twitter and Facebook. As I mentioned, we've had the um, kind of cool Facebook and Twitter social media promotions last go around, which has helped us engage um, more students and have sort of a youthful feel to it. We have videos on YouTube. We've been working with uh, radio stations to um, have the DJs actually post financial aid messages to their Facebook and Twitter accounts. And then, as I mentioned, we've been engaged in social media essay concept contests. And as Paul mentioned, the campaign is working. Since um, the launch in 0304, we've had more than 2.5 million students visit the website. And the number of community college students receiving some type of financial aid has increased by 70%. This just gives you a real quick snapshot of a year. This is the most recent year that we have results. For the 12-13 um, academic year, the I Can Afford College website had 347,000 unique visitors. We had 152 million impressions from our online advertising, 142 million impressions from radio advertising. Uh, what a really important element of the campaign is to directly connect our students with the financial aid office where the expectation is that they'll get one-on-one -on -one assistance. And we're able to directly um, count the students that have been connected through our website or through our toll-free line, and we know that in that year alone we directly connected 17,000 students. Um, that means they went from our website to the college website, um, and, and we know we've connected more than that, but that's a pretty solid number. Uh, this gives you an idea of the website. We've had the website up, as Paul mentioned, for 10 years. It is definitely time for a refresh. We did some research about a year ago. We found that the information on the site was still very usable. Students really liked it. They found it easy to navigate, but they felt that it just didn't have the pizzazz of some of the newer websites. So um, we we worked with students and um, the California Student Financial Aid Administrators Association to, uh, to get feedback and design a website. Some of the features of our new website include a more modern design. Um, we're actually now featuring photos from our students and faculty. We thought it would be good to highlight our own college campuses as opposed to buying stock photography. Um, we have enhanced navigation. One of the things that we heard when we did the usability testing about a year ago is that in addition to um, students <coughs> wanting to sort of free surf the site, there was a certain percentage of students that wanted step by step. They wanted to have their hands held. They wanted to be taken through the process. So when we're getting ready to launch this new site within the next couple of weeks, we've added a step by step option where if somebody wants that help, they can go through each step. And then we've also included success story videos to, to really bring that um, tell a friend feel to life. So here's uh, just a real quick image of what our new website homepage will look like. And this is one of the internal pages, and this is one of the pages I talked about that really takes you through step-by-step -step eligibility. If they want to know what they're eligible <coughs> for or how to find out if they're eligible, they can click there. If they want to jump into the process at step two, get ready to apply, they can. So we've laid out all the steps, and the students can join in wherever they feel most comfortable or feel like they need the assistance. So we just completed usability testing, and uh, what we heard from the usability testing is that the site is really well organized and easy to use. There's valuable content that really makes sense. They appreciate multiple ways to navigate, and uh, the most important one is that they're more likely to apply for aid after using the website. Uh, 
the campaign has always been very collaborative. Um, we worked in the development of the site. We've shared it with Cabinet for feedback here at the Chancellor's Office with the Student Services Division that's been very, very um, helpful in getting the information together and putting it in a um, student-friendly format. We've shared it with the CSPA Executive Board and Select College Financial Aid Directors so that we can get their feedback and we're using that to refine the site right now. So the website timeline for, timeline for the new release, we're planning to launch it within the next one to two weeks. And then the phase two updates will be completed during the 14-15 fiscal year. And some of the things that we have planned for phase two are, um, we've heard from students that they want uh, FAFSA tutorial in a video format. So we're looking at different ways that we can um, either purchase that or get that donated to the system. We're also, um, working to add some cost calculators to the website where students can get a better um, sense of the overall cost to attend a community college. So I've included for you, and you'll have packets that you can take home, the current website address as well as the um, test website where you can view the test website. And if you have any feedback that you'd like to share with us in the next week or so, we would love to hear from you. So please feel free to take a look at that test site. And then, as Paul mentioned, we've um, captured the attention of Hollywood and are very excited. And hopefully within the next um, couple of board meetings, we'll be able to share with you some good news about um, some Hollywood stars that we're hoping will help promote this campaign. Are there any questions? Thank you, Paige. Uh, you know, this is very impressive. And, you know, the, the, the contact data uh, kind of speaks for itself as to, to the reach that we're, we're having. And, and this is so enormously needed and useful for uh, individuals who need uh, uh, the support in terms of college. So, you know, great, great job. Member Asumi? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I mean, are we going to see I Can Afford a College at the Golden Globes next year? So yeah, <laughs> possibly. There's <laughs> nothing. <laughs> well, they should get an award for the best campaign, that's for sure. So, uh, anyway, I, I want to just uh, reiterate uh, uh, and second what uh, President Baca said. Uh, Congratulations on such a great success over all these years. Uh, I mean, the only thing I, I was just uh, I had a small question, just in terms of like as a layperson uh, to understand some of the statistics. W what does it mean to uh, when you say 152 million impressions? What, what's an impression from online advertising? Uh, folks that are able to see and view the ad online. That's okay. the estimated number of of people that are seeing the ad from oh. the diff various websites that we're, we're on. Okay, well, I mean, it's, it's incredibly impressive numbers. So, uh, again, congratulations. Thank you. Vice President Ma. So, in a way, they just played the ad, and so they could have said with 50 people in the room, there were 50 impressions of that campaign that was just received by playing that ad for us at one point. I had a question, uh, too. The, um, we have 2 million students, but we've got about 300,000 uh, visits to the website. The are campuses, local districts, putting links to this mm -hmm. on their local websites because that's where that's going to drive some uh, traffic. I would expect. And we do. We've worked with the colleges. We've provide button, provided buttons to all mm -hmm. the colleges to put it on their websites. Really, I think by the time they get to their local website, they're generally looking for their college-specific information. But we have invited the colleges to put a button for more information so that they don't have to duplicate everything that we have on, their, on our site on their site. So um, we've had really good success in working with the colleges. As you know, we can't mandate that the colleges put it on their website. But um, at various times of the year, it kind of comes up and it goes up and down on the sites depending on what um, other initiatives they have and what they have going on. But we've had, I would say, probably up to 70 to 80 percent participation in using the buttons. And there's and also a uh, dedicated I Can Afford College uh, Twitter account um, that is very active and that individual colleges will retweet or take that content mm -hmm. and push it out on their own uh, social media platforms. Yeah, that, that's my hope is that there you've put so much work in developing this resource that uh, um, a, a local district, I'm a student, I apply, I, I should see a button to say, okay, now how am I going to pay for it or something like that. The, um, also, the campaign must be have uh, resonate also, not just with community college prospective students, but students for the Cal States mm -hmm. and the UCs and all that. When, when somebody comes to it, do they, because if I just hear I can afford college, I'm pro but I may be a Cal State student. Is there a way that students then 
can navigate through to see does it take them to financial aid uh, pathways for other uh, systems or other students? We've made pretty clear on the website that it is a California Community Colleges website. We have a contact page on the site where if somebody is looking for information that's not included, they can contact us. And those emails come directly to me. And I can tell you we probably get about 50 emails a year mm -hmm. where it's somebody that isn't a community college student, but maybe they want information on a private college or a UC or a CSU. And at that point, we direct them to those system offices to find out or to the college website that they're interested in attending to get more information on website. And have you reserved all the other uh, domain URLs like .net, .org, .all that so that they all We have. We've this? purchased and redirected. I think we own a total of 18 website URLs that redirect to this one. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thank you both very much. Nice answer. Thank you. you. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Um, we are uh, going to move uh, an item from tomorrow's uh, agenda, item uh, uh, 4.2, update on veteran services to today. But before we get started with that, we're going to take a very short five-minute break. We'll reconvene, cover that, and then we'll uh, end the day's activities. Thank you. Hmm? I guess.